Thank you very much. Uh, the next item of business this afternoon is portfolio questions. And we'll start with question number one from Alec Rowley. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what support it can provide to teachers in Fife regarding reports of over £2 million of reductions in the secondary school education budget. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. President Officer, despite continued UK Government real terms cuts to Scotland's resource budget, we have treated local government very fairly. This year, Fife's Council, Fife Council's increase in spending power to support local authority day-to-day -day services, including secondary school education, amounts to £18.8 .8 million, or 3%, compared to 2017-18. Alec Rowley. Um, thank you for that, for that answer. I'm tempted to say, meanwhile, in the real world, and I don't mean that disrespectfully. The fact is that a presentation that's been given to teachers across Fife right now shows that savings approved by Fife Council in secondary education, £4.095 million. Pounds, and it then says, of these £4.095 million savings, £2.338 million pound is expected to come directly out of school budgets. The reality is that teachers, with all the pressures that they've got on them, are now being asked how to work out in the secondary schools in Fife how they're going to cut hundreds of thousands of pounds out of their working budgets. Does the Cabinet, the first, the Cabinet Secretary and Deputy First Minister think that's acceptable? I won't even start on the cuts in primary school. How are we going to raise attainment if we're seeing these levels of cuts taking place in our frontline education in the classrooms? Cabinet Secretary. The, the first thing I'd say to Mr Rowley is that obviously I attach the greatest of importance to investment in education, which is, what, which is the foundation of the government's education uh, approach and particularly the focus on the Scottish Attainment Challenge and on pupil equity funding. Now, I reiterate to Mr Early the point I made in my earlier answer that uh, Fife Council um, will be, its budget will be increasing by £8.8 .8 million pounds spending power um, as a consequence of the decisions in the government's budget. Um, we are of course seeing funds being directed, uh, uh, distributed directly to individual schools. Um, schools in Fife have been allocated over £10 million in pupil equity funding, which I know from my various visits around Fife has been used very effectively by uh, Fife schools to meet the needs of young people. And of course also, in addition to this, and I've just come from a meeting of the Scottish Education Council at which the um, Executive Director of Education from Fife Council was present, who is leading the South East of Scotland Improvement Collaborative. And uh, we heard at the Education Council this morning of the very significant plans that have been deployed by the Improvement uh, Collaborative to support the enhancement of education in the school sector in Scotland. So um, I understand the, the points that Mr Rowley is making. Uh, these are decisions that Fife Council must make within the overall financial allocations made by the Scottish Government and other sources of money available to it. But on that part of it, I think the Scottish Government has invested significantly in uh, local services in Fife Council. Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Cabinet Secretary, several heads at schools in Fife have told me they would like to spend pupil equity fund money on employing more teachers with skills and additional support needs but that the spending of pupil equity fund money on additional teachers is not permitted. Can the Cabinet Secretary clarify the situation if this is correct? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, uh, of, of course, pupil equity funding can be used to employ members of staff. And um, I can say to Mr Stewart that there are... Um, well, I can't get the right... Oh, yes, I can. Uh, 506 additional teachers have been employed under the Scottish Attainment Challenge and um, pupil equity funding arrangements. So uh, that provision exists around the country, so there's no reason why that shouldn't apply in Fife. I'd also be very surprised, uh, to be honest, that uh, schools in Fife would face that difficulty, because I can think of particular examples where additional teachers have been recruited by schools in Fife and are able to contribute to the education of young people. Question number two, Ben McPherson. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government ro what role the Educational Maintenance Allowance, or EMA, plays in encouraging young people to stay on at school. Cabinet Secretary. President Officer, the Education Maintenance Allowance programme provides a, a financial incentive for 16 to 19 year olds from low income households who are attending non advanced learning in school, college, or are on an activity agreement to stay in learning. Those who are home educated are also eligible. 
The EMA programme is an entitlement in Scotland, unlike the rest of the United Kingdom. The Scottish Government wants young people to be able to choose from the same learning opportunities, regardless of background or circumstance. Ben McPherson. Thank you. I, I, I appreciate that answer from the Cabinet Secretary and welcome the fact that the SNP Government continues to recognise the importance of the EMA programme and its role in allowing our young people to make learning decisions based on their abilities and aspirations rather than their financial circumstances. Can the Cabinet Secretary outline what proportion of EMA recipients live in our most disadvantaged areas? Cabinet Secretary. Um, President Officer, the latest statistics on education maintenance allowance show that those living in Scotland's 20% deprived, most, deprived, most deprived areas in 2016 increased to 36.8% from 34.9% in the previous year. Um, these figures tell us that um, education maintenance allowance arrangements continue to make a positive difference to those from the most disadvantaged areas in Scotland, and I welcome that increase that's taken place in the most recent figures that are available. Mary Fee. This morning at the Education and Skills Committee, we heard evidence that families lose access to clothing grants and tax credits when a pupil applies for education maintenance allowance. This results in families falling into poverty and debt due to the gap in processing the applications. What action will the Scottish Government take to prevent families falling further into debt as a result of applying for EMA? Um, I'll look with care at the transcript of the committee this morning to follow that evidence, but it's my understanding that the decision as to whether or not other benefits are forfeited as a consequence of applying for EMA will be enshrined in individual rules pursued by individual local authorities in terms of their eligibility criteria. Now, I'll look with care at the point that Mary Fee raises because I would be concerned that if a, young, if a family were to apply for an education maintenance allowance, but then to forfeit access to other elements of provision, such as a school clothing grant, because an EMA will be available to an older pupil, and older pupils will be obliged by the same rules on uniform that school clothing grants are designed to try to support and to assist. So I'll look, if Mary Fee has particular information she wants to draw to my attention, I'll look at it carefully, because certainly that is not the policy intention I would want to be seeing um, emerging from this, and I will examine the details of that to see what the government can do to rectify it. But it may be within individual decisions taken by local authorities over which I have no control. Question number three, Rhoda Grant. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to encourage female pupils to consider enrolling in the STEM teaching initiative run by the Universities of Dundee and of the Highlands and Islands. Uh, sorry, Minister Shirley Ann Somerville. The Scottish Government's STEM strategy includes a range of actions aimed at encouraging women and girls to take up STEM related careers. The partnership induction model being developed by the University of Dundee, supported by £240,000 worth of uh, Scottish Government funding, will contribute to this goal. The University of Dundee has more females than males across their STEM teacher education programme currently and also has an action plan in place to encourage the ongoing recruitment of underrepresented groups, including females, into STEM teaching. This new programme is being marketed in conjunction with four partner local authorities who will also actively encourage female applicants. Rhoda Grant. There's a big skills shortage in engineering and very few women taking up a career in this area. And indeed, within all STEM careers, women only make up 14.4% of the workforce. This won't change, as it would appear that there are still a shortage of girls taking up STEM subjects in school, which are crucial to them having a career in the sector going forward. Can I ask this, what the Scottish Government is doing to ensure that more girls choose maths and science at school? Minister. Well, there are a number of uh, measures that are detailed within the STEM strategy, which I had the pleasure of launching uh, last year. And recently at uh, the implementation group, the second implementation group for that STEM strategy, we discussed uh, some of these very um, issues around uh, the gender imbalance uh, that included tackling some of the unconscious bias which um, goes on within society and how we can do that within school, uh, building on the fine work of the Institute of Physics within that area. We're obviously, of course, also looking at what can be done to tackle some of the challenges around apprenticeships, 
um, that's being led by my colleague, Mr Hepburn, and also around the further education and higher education challenges we have uh, through the Funding Council's Gender Action Plan. There are a number of other method, uh, methods which are being dealt with, particularly through the STEM strategy. Um, and for example, some of the KPIs deal specifically with the challenges around gender and balance um, around schools and encouraging that take up. So um, if the member has further uh, questions in relation to some of the particular aspects within the STEM strategy and how we can take that further, I would be happy to take um, that up with her in due course. Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Following the recent refresh of the Royal Society of Edinburgh's publication, Tapping All Our Talents, what measures are the government taking to ensure women who are qualified but not currently working in STEM have an opportunity to take up the new STEM initiatives? Minister. I had the, the pleasure of um, receiving an update on um, all this, albeit um, briefly and informally, when I attended the UKRI reception last night, uh, where I spoke to Professor Yellowlees, who is chairing uh, that working group uh, from the RSE. Um, we are having very detailed discussions between government officials, uh, myself and with the RSE, about how we can support them in terms of the data that they're looking at, um, and have committed to working with the RSE to look at the um, updated recommendations that they have once they have refreshed that strategy. The consultation, as I understand it, is still ongoing. We do, of course, have a number of measures that we are um, uh, to, to tackle uh, gender imbalance at the moment. Those include for example, funding through the Equalities Budget to support Equate Scotland, an organisation that, as the member knows, works to tackle women's underrepresentation in the STEM sector. For example, uh, through CareerWise, a placement scheme exclusively for women studying STEM subjects at the universities and colleges, and also through Equate Scotland funding up to £50,000 to deliver a women returner programme. So we are taking action at the moment, uh, but are very aware and um, um, helping in any way we can the RSC and we will listen very carefully to the recommendations that come from that refresh. Question number four, James Kelly. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met officials from South Lanarkshire Council's Education Resources. Cabinet Secretary Johnson. Presiding officer, my officials meet regularly with officials from South Lanarkshire Council's Education Resources to address a range of issues. James Kelly. Thank you. Secretary for that answer. The Child Poverty Action Group told the Education Committee uh, last month that young people face a postcode lottery in terms of their opportunities in, in education. Um, that is uh, emphasised in the South Lanarkshire Council uh, attainment figures where the, those that are able to attain the, five, the standard of five national fives uh, is just over a third running below the national average. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that the objective should be to give a fair opportunity for all young children in Scotland, and that is constrained by the government policy of penalising councils through cuts, as demonstrated by the £134 per head of cuts that South Lanarkshire Council uh, citizens have faced since 2014? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I, was, I thought I was on the verge of agreeing with quite a bit of Mr Kelly until he got to the last bit. But on the first bit of Mr Kelly's question, I unreservedly agree with him that I think and the whole focus of the government's education policy, with its emphasis on the achievement of excellence and equity for all, is about ensuring that young people, regardless of their background, are able to achieve their potential within the education system. And some of the disparities that have existed within our education system for all of my lifetime are what we are trying to tackle by the focus on the attainment agenda. Now, in relation specifically to South Lanarkshire, um, there's three points that I would make. The first is that South Lanarkshire Council's spending power has increased by £16.3 million, pounds, or 3%, in this financial year compared to last. Secondly, uh, schools in South Lanarkshire will be benefiting to the tune of um, seven point, just short of £8 million pounds in the current financial year in pupil equity funding. And what I've seen in, from pupil equity funding is schools really being able to take specific action to address the individual issues that confront them within their own localities as a consequence of having the resources of pupil equity funding available. So in all of the localities that Mr Kelly will be concerned about, 
they have, I think, the means now available to help them to address that attainment challenge. And thirdly, um, in the context of having the resources available for schools, in South Lanarkshire, um, there has been an increase in the number of teachers that are available in the South, South Lanarkshire schools uh, in the latest census, um, with an increase from 3,202 to 3,282, which I think is a, a welcome indication of the priority that's been allocated to education and the increase in the numbers of the teaching professionals that are there to educate our young people. Claire Hockey. Sorry, I've... Oh, beg pardon. <laughs> Uh, question number five, Jamie Green. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what actions schools take to protect children from knife crime. Cabinet Secretary John Sweeney. President Officer, all schools in all staff in schools share a responsibility for identifying the care and well-being needs of children and young people. Schools should establish open, positive, supportive relationships across the whole school community. Education authorities, in consultation with key partners, including staff unions, should develop their own policy on knives and offensive weapons within the wider context of positive relationships, learning and behaviour. The Scottish Government is also investing significantly in various violence reduction preventative approaches with young people across Scotland as part of a wider strategy to promote positive relationships and behaviour. Since 2007, we've invested over £14 million in violence reduction programmes for young people and we continue to expand the work undertaken with children and young people on these programmes. Jamie Green. Uh, may I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response, but recent figures show that the number of pupils being excluded uh, from school uh, 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 for incidents uh, involving conventional or even improvised weapons is currently at a five-year high with an average of two exclusions per day involving a violent incident with a weapon. Uh, given these quite shocking statistics, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary if it is his understanding that local authorities have standardised their processes on gathering knife crime data, why he thinks there is a five-year high uh, in incidents, and what comfort can he offer parents that when they send their child to school, they're sending them to a weapon-free and safe environment? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the first thing I'd say to uh, Mr Green is that um, I agree with the aspirations of his question, that parents should be expected to send their children to weapon-free schools in a safe environment and all of the work that we undertake um, and yesterday I chaired a meeting of the, um, the, the wider stakeholder group on behaviour in schools, it's um, called SIGRABIS and it um, focuses on putting in place the mechanisms to enable positive behaviour to be and a positive ethos to be created within schools so that the type of policy environment that Mr Green would expect to see is present in every school with an emphasis on um, removing the instances of any weapon carrying. The statistics to which Mr Green refers are a concern to us because we have seen for some time reductions in the overall levels of, of exclusion and generally in Scottish education levels of exclusion are falling but we've seen a rise in the instance of exclusions in relation to, to weapons and weapon carrying. I think what that tells us is that we must ensure that we have a vigorous involvement in some of the activities such as the No Knives Better Lives campaign, which is a youth engagement programme, or, the, the, or the work of the mentors in, uh, in violence prevention programme, to make sure that these programmes are felt within individual schools and the positive behaviours that we would expect to see in our schools are prevalent in all of our schools. And I assure Mr Green that these considerations are very much uppermost in the mind of ministers and our stakeholders in trying to ensure that we create the environment to which he referred in his question. James Dornan. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, obviously, this is a very serious issue, Cabinet Secretary. And, but and although I think it's probably harder for uh, young people to access knives and, in terms of buying them, etc., what sort of discussions has the government had with the UK government around restricting the online sale of knives? Mr. Secretary. These uh, are in the aftermath of the Bailey Gwynn tragedy. The, the government obviously considered the recommendations that came from the report that uh, examined uh, those circumstances, and from that the Justice Secretary made representations to the United Kingdom Government uh, to work together to 
um, raised concerns about the online sale of knives and the need for a cohesive approach between our actions and those of the UK Government. Um, the United Kingdom Government agreed with that approach and in October published a consultation on knives, corrosive substances and firearms. Um, the consultation extended some of those proposals to Scotland and the consultation ended just before Christmas. The United Kingdom Government are currently working with our officials on preparing legislation to address these, the concerns about online sales of knives because these are reserved responsibilities and we're very um, keen to cooperate with the United Kingdom Government in putting in place the most effective regime we can to tackle this issue. Thank you. Um, I appreciate the detail of the Cabinet Secretary's answers, but I would encourage some succinctness to get through some of our questions. Question number six, Rona Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it encourages people to consider becoming teachers in STEM subjects. Minister Shirley Ann Somerville. We have taken a series of actions to encourage more people into teaching STEM subjects. A Teaching Makes People recruitment campaign targets STEM undergraduates and career changers to consider teaching as a career. We've increased student intake targets for the STEM subjects and we are offering bursaries of up to £20,000 for up to 100 career changers to train to teach in STEM subjects. We're also supporting innovative new routes into teaching in STEM subjects. These include the University of Strathclyde's master's course for STEM graduates to complete an initial teacher education course alongside a master's degree. Bruna Mackay. Thank the Minister for that answer. In my constituency of Strathkelvin and Bears Den, one school is only able to offer an elective computing class to third year students due to a shortage of teachers. Does the Minister agree that this subject is crucial to young people's future careers and should not be compromised where possible? Minister. Well, I do absolutely agree that digital skills are of crucial importance both for everyday life and for Scotland's future economic posterity. And indeed, only yesterday I was at Tully Allen Primary School where I heard firsthand the work that are being done um, in a number of schools and secondary schools to develop young people's digital skills through the Digital Schools Awards programme. Uh, we do recognise that some councils are facing challenges in relation to STEM teacher recruitment, and that's why the government has taken a number of actions to support further in te uh, improvement within teacher recruitment. Some of those I mentioned in my original answer. But there are also work, for example, ongoing with Aberdeen University to allow former oil and gas workers to train as teachers, uh, the bursaries which I mentioned uh, to Rona Mackay earlier, and also the work, for example, we're doing with the University of uh, Dundee, where we're looking at highly qualified graduates and career changers specialising in science and technology-related subjects. So this is um, an issue which the government is determined to take more concerted action on. Oliver Mundell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. There are some encouraging signs that uptake in higher and advanced higher is increasing in some science subjects, but there are others where uptake is falling. What is the Scottish Government doing to improve uptake across the board? Yes. Well, the, the issue around encouraging more young people, but particularly young women, uh, to take up uh, STEM subjects within school and then hopefully within an apprenticeship, further education or higher education, is something which uh, we are doing a, a number of strands of work on, um, as I mentioned um, earlier on in a previous answer. Um, most of these are detailed very specifically within uh, the STEM strategy. Uh, we are looking to um, inspire uh, we are looking to connect the work that we're doing through inspiring young people all the way through early years primary and secondary um, school uh, subject choices um, and then also to connect that to ensuring that the young people know about the exciting opportunities that there are for them to be able to access STEM careers um, at the end of that. So the issue around the uptake um, of STEM subjects um, is something which the government again is taking action on along with the funding council um, and uh, for example in the STEM implementation group, we have uh, the representation from COSLA and from ADES. So we're taking a whole systems approach to looking very carefully at the challenges that we have um, around attracting more young people into STEM subjects so that they can see the opportunities that are undoubtedly out there for them. Ian Gray. Uh, thank you. Can I ask the Minister uh, how many people have signed up to the Career, career Change or Bursary Programme? Minister. Uh, there are a number of um, different uh, schemes which, um, the, uh, which individuals can go on to within our different universities. 
um, to look at uh, encouraging a, a STEM uh, career. Um, those um, examples, uh, many of which have um, started, uh, but there are others that are due to start in 2018. Um, if the member would like um, detailed figures about the number which have started a specific course, um, I would be happy to um, extend that information um, to him. We can then look at um, the progress that we're taking um, on to date, um, who has signed up, um, but particularly to encourage more people um, to take advantage of the, the courses uh, that um, are, are due to take place in due course. And question number seven, Tavish Scott. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government uh, whether any changes that will be introduced to the governance of education will be island proofed. Cabinet Secretary. Any changes proposed will be island proofed. Tavish the the uh, Cabinet Secretary will be aware that Cunningsborough Primary School in Shetland has a head teacher who teaches. Shetland's Council advised me that it is increasingly difficult to recruit uh, head teachers who also have to teach as part of their day-to-day -day responsibilities. Uh, given that reality, not just in Shetland but in other parts of the country as well, if he plans to increase the responsibility of head teachers, uh, how, will that be, how will that work in the context of island proofing? Have a second. What, uh, what I want to make sure, and this is a, a, a consideration that applies in any circumstance around the country, whether it's an island circumstance or a mainland circumstance, is that young people are able to have access to the strongest quality of leadership and learning and teaching in individual schools, because those two elements are the foundation of a successful education at local level. So any of the reforms that we bring forward will be about strengthening that leadership capability ensuring leadership has got more support available to it and to ensure that that support is also available to enhance the quality of learning and teaching. And those provisions will be applied. I quite understand the different circumstances that exist in many of the schools that Mr Scott represents in his constituency. Uh, and uh, to that end, we will ensure that the steps we take forward uh, take due account of those considerations in the final design of our legislative proposals. And Jimmy Halcrow Johnson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Yesterday, a number of uh, people protested outside Orkney Islands Council at the proposed uh, cuts to support for learning budgets, and the Council has now uh, decided not to pro proceed with those proposals. Uh, the, the Cabinet Secretary will be aware that because of the geography and uh, demographics, island communities are often less able to collaborate and share costs between schools for these types of services. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary to outline what provision there is to ensure that budgets assigned for support for learning are sufficient to meet local needs, and whether ministers have had any contact with the Council um, over these particular proposals? Cabinet Secretary. There's been no dialogue with the Council, to my knowledge, uh, about these proposals, but obviously these are ordinarily and properly a matter for Orkney Islands Council to, to consider. Uh, what I'd say to Mr Halker Johnson is that um, the, uh, he raises the point about the challenges of collaboration within the island communities. In, in, in fact, in my view, the best example of inter-authority cooperation on education policy is in fact the Northern Alliance, which includes Orkney Islands Council as one of the members of that, count, of that grouping. And what I detect from talking to practitioners around the north of Scotland is that they're feeling the benefit of the cooperation, particularly about the strengthening of learning and teaching, which is able to be facilitated by that cooperation across a number of different authorities. And indeed, some of the smaller, more remote local authorities are benefiting enormously from their cooperation with other authorities. So I think there's, there's good work going on in that respect. Um, it's work that takes that pays proper respect to the democratic um, interests and, and, and perspective of Orkney Islands Council, but it enables the Council to cooperate with others to enhance educational provision for the young people of Orkney. Question number eight, Anas Sarwar. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the EIS campaign, Value Education, Value Teachers, which is calling for a restorative pay rise for teachers. Cabinet Secretary. So we value Scotland's teachers highly. We are committed to taking an active role in the current discussions through the Scottish Negotiating Committee for Teachers, and I would urge everyone around the table to take a constructive approach. This government is the first anywhere in the United Kingdom to commit to lift the 1% public sector pay cap, and the teachers' pay deal for 2017-18 is an example of exactly that. And I start with the truth is, Reading Officer, that under SNP management, our teachers have seen their pay go from amongst the highest in the OECD to well below the average. Not only that, but they are now teaching some of the biggest class sizes in Europe. This government has cut 4,000 of their colleagues and still managed to create a teacher recruitment crisis. When will the Cabinet Secretary accept it is not divisive reforms that our teachers need? They need the pay they deserve 
and the support and the resources to do the job they do so well under more difficult circumstances. Cabinet Secretary. Um, I'd remind Mr Sarwar that we have been living in a period of fiscal austerity applied by United Kingdom governments going back to when his government was in power in, before the 2010 election. So it's all very well for Mr Sarwar to come here and to talk about pay constraint, but pay constraint was applied by the Labour government uh, when it was in office because of the financial crisis that the Labour government presided over in the aftermath of 2008. So it's not easy for Mr Sarwar to come here with his simple solutions to the problem. Now, what I'm committed to is a substantive negotiation with the teaching profession. As I indicated in my original answer, our work in 2017 has seen us deliver a pay deal for teachers which has um, moved out with the uh, pay caps that have been in place, and I welcome that fact. We are committed to putting in place the support and the assistance to enhance the teaching profession because I want teaching to be an attractive career for individuals. And I would close by reminding Mr Sarwar that there has been a, an increase in the number of teachers in our schools over the last 12, uh, 12 months of 543. And that's a very welcome increase in the number of teachers that are in post in Scotland schools. Question number nine, James Dornan. To ask the Scottish Government what progress has been made with COSLA regarding funding for increasing the provision of early learning and childcare to 1140 hours per year. And I suspect I know the answer. Minister Marie Todd. Thank you for the question. Scottish ministers and COSLA leaders reached a landmark agreement on a multi-year revenue and capital funding package for the expansion of early learning and childcare on the 27th of April. This agreement, which is the culmination of more than two years of hard work by local authorities and Scottish government, represents a shared understanding of the costs required to deliver the expansion in entitlement to funded early learning and childcare to 1140 hours from August 2020. It's evidence of real partnership working to deliver a shared ambition and to give all of our children the best start in life. Under this agreement, the Scottish Government will provide local authorities with additional recurring revenue funding of £567 million per year by 2021-22, the first full financial year of the expansion. And in addition, the Scottish Government will provide local authorities with capital funding of £476 million over four financial years, 2017-18 to 2021 inclusive. James Dornan. I congratulate the Minister on her role in, in reaching this landmark deal and thank her for her response. Uh, the, the deal with local government will ensure our children to get the best possible start in life, but can she outline how this expansion will deliver the flexibility that parents need to support them in work or training and whether she thinks the flexibility is already improving? Minister. Thank you for the question. I believe that the flexibility, the simple increase in the number of hours available to parents will make a massive difference to every family in the land. So it will save four and a half thousand pounds per year per child for each family. The um, funding follows the child model underpinned by the national standard will indeed um, be a provider neutral um, aim, um, a provider neutral means of delivering flexibility to the parents, which will absolutely transform their upon opportunity to work and to um, pursue education themselves. Question number 10, Mike Rumbles. <clears throat> to ask the Scottish Government, when the Education Secretary last met the Director of Education and Children's Services for Aberdeenshire Council. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. Uh, I last met the Director of Education and Children's Services for Aberdeenshire Council on the 7th of March. Mike Rumbles. Thank you for that answer, Cabinet Secretary. Will the Cabinet Secretary meet the new director when he or she is appointed and discuss with him or her the overall state of staff morale in our North East schools? And could he outline to us now, today, what specifically he can do from his perspective to help improve staff morale? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I, I'm very happy to engage with Mr Rumbles about um, his perspective on these matters but when I go around schools I uh, meet teachers who are uh, very positive and utterly motivated by 
the work that they are doing to educate young people. Uh, I was in Smithycroft Secondary School in Glasgow this morning where um, I have to say the, the, the staff and the, um, the leadership team were uh, very buoyant about the conditions of Scottish education. In relation to the North East of Scotland, we are of course taking a range of different measures uh, to enhance the recruitment of teachers in the North East of Scotland uh, by some of the new routes into teaching that we are undertaking. Uh, we are supporting the delivery of education uh, very directly. Aberdeenshire Council is benefiting to the tune of £3 million in pupil equity funding very directly into our schools. But if there's particular concerns that Mr Rumbles has, I'm very happy to, uh, to consider those and to do what I can to address them with the Director of Education at Aberdeenshire Council um, once they are appointed after the retirement of Maria Walker. Question number 11, Ivan McKee. Uh, thank you. To ask the Scottish Government how it enshrines the rights of young people and how it plans to further embed these. Minister Marie Todd. We are committed to enhancing children's rights across all aspects of Scottish life. The Children and Young People's Scotland Act 2014 places specific duties on all ministers to consider steps which might give better or further effect to the UNCRC. And these provisions take us further than any Sc previous Scottish Government. We continue to look for opportunities to apply the principles of the Convention on an issue-by-issue -issue basis where we consider it right and proper to do so. For example, through raising the minimum age of criminal responsibility from 8 to 12 and supporting Mr Finney's proposals to introduce a legislative ban on the physical punishment of children. It's very fitting that in this year of young people, a global first, we have commenced a comprehensive audit on the most effective and practical way to further embed the principles of the UNCRC into policy and legislation, including the option of full incorporation into domestic law. Ivan McKee. I uh, thank the Minister for the answer. Can the Minister outline what the Scottish Government's position is on the rights of young people to opt out of religious observance in schools and all the forthcoming education and governance bill enshrine their right to do so. Minister. As Mr McKee may be aware, the Scottish Government's statutory guidance on religious observance amended in March 2017 states that schools should include children and young people in any discussions about aspects of their school experience, ensuring that their views are taken in, into account. The law currently provides a right for parents to withdraw their children from participation in religious observance. The statutory guidance makes it clear that local authorities must ensure that pupils' views are taken into account, rather than providing pupils with a direct opt-out. The Scottish Government's view is that pupils' views should be supported to make their views and preferences clear. Ministers are open to exploring the best way to give effect to children's rights as expressed under the UNCRC. However, any changes that there might be to the current statutory position would need to be subject to full consultation with all key stakeholders. Question number 12, Colin Beattie. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the development of the new Battle High School Digital Centre of Excellence. Cabinet Secretary. Officer, the development of a digital centre of excellence as part of the new high school at New Battle is an initiative of Midlothian Council. I commend the collaborative approach being taken by the Council in seeking to ensure that young people across all Midlothian secondary schools have access to specialist digital learning and a diverse range of pathways to follow into digital jobs. I am aware of the funding shortfall for the digital centre of excellence at the new school and I have asked my officials to explore opportunities for supporting the progress of this project. Colin Beattie. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware that New Battle High School's catchment area has too many pockets of relative deprivation. Would he agree with me that all involved in the creation of this centre should be congratulated for this groundbreaking and forward-thinking initiative that will have a considerable and positive effect on the life chances of young people in the area? Yes, President Officer, I think this is a, a, an excellent initiative by uh, Midlothian Council. I think it recognises the need to ensure that there are clear pathways for young people to be able to access education and then to have links into the world of work. It fits very comfortably into the Developing Scotland's Young Workforce Agenda. And as I indicated in my earlier answer, I'm very keen to see if there's any way in which we can be of assistance. Thank you. Try to squeeze in question 13. Liz Smith. Uh, thank you, President. Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it's having with local authorities regarding the provision of music tuition in schools. Secretary. Officer, the Scottish education system devolves decision making to the most appropriate level, enabling local authorities to make choices to meet their local circumstances and needs. 
I am, however, very concerned about decisions by a number of local authorities to reduce access to instrumental music tuition for young people. I have asked my officials, while respecting the autonomy and responsibility of local councils, to assess the impact and identify ways of working with key st stakeholders to ensure that instrumental music tuition remains accessible in the future. Liz Smith. Uh, thank you for that answer, Cabinet Secretary. I think uh, local authorities of all political persuasions are having great difficulty on this uh, issue. Uh, can I ask what the timescale is for your working group to report to Parliament? Because, as you rightly say, it is a very urgent matter. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, there is work uh, underway which has been led by John Wallace, uh, formerly the principal of the, uh, the Royal Conservatory of Scotland. And um, I'm uh, looking forward to meeting with the Music Education Partnership to discuss um, their thinking on these matters and the, it's an issue in which the Culture Secretary and I are both actively involved. Um, I don't have a specific timescale I can offer uh, Liz Smith today, but I can assure her that I'll be happy to engage in dialogue with members of all uh, political persuasions to ensure that this important characteristic of education in Scotland is available for young people across our country. Thank you very much. And that concludes portfolio questions. Can I thank all members and ministers for their contributions? We'll move on now to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion 11984 in the name of Miles Briggs on NHS financial accountability. And could I um, urge members who wish to speak in this debate to contribute to press their request to speak buttons uh, whenever they wish or as soon as possible. Could I also just note um, for members' interest that uh, the Conservative Party have asked um, to use the new sort of debate management flexibility to increase the number of speakers from three to four, but that means that Conservative speakers will have one minute less. They'll be speaking for five minutes rather than six-minute contributions. However, as it happens, we've got quite a lot of time available over the afternoon, so I would encourage all members to take, take interventions. <laughs>